Hello, Yuna. Hello, Jesse. Um, this is a panel titled How Can Digital Fashion Empower and Preserve Craft and Heritage? Or actually, what are the relationship between digital fashion uh, and culture, speaking more broadly? Uh, this is a part of Responsible uh, Fashion Series, which this year is taking part, uh, taking place in Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan from 10th till 20th of March. Fortunately, we cannot be there in person. And also because of time difference, we cannot really... Uh, do it uh, in real time, in real time online. So we are pre-recording the session on the uh, 10th of March to be presented on the 13th of March. Uh, we have today three speakers. I will be leading with a short introduction. My name is Bada Vilchuk. Uh, I am a researcher and strategist. I work running a consultancy and educational lab called Unfolding Strategies. And I also am doing now a PhD focusing on decentralization and fashion and education at Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna and uh, University uh, in Helsinki, called Aalto, where I'm also doing a part of my research. Uh, and today's panel very much uh, falls into my quite broad interest in fashion and innovation and technology and how basically things are shaping and changing uh, for the future. This panel was proposed in late summer last year, so it was interesting also to see how many different things on the topic have been shaping. And uh, I have with me two great speakers, uh, Yuna Kim and Jesse Fu. So if I could like to, uh, if I could have you now introduce yourself, that would be great. Yuna, would you like to go first? Uh, yeah, I can. Hi, I'm Yuna. I'm an anthropologist and I'm very interested in the relationship between technology and locality. Um, I'm currently um, doing my PhD in the project Object Space Agency within the Cluster of Excellence Matters of Activity as well as Center for Anthropological Research on Museum and Heritage at the Humboldt University in Berlin. Um, I look into East Asian cosmology and its relation with technical objects through the constantly reimagined Korean sartorial heritage, which I'm wearing right now as well. Um, my PhD project is based on the Korean notion of salim, which means enlivening. Um, and I use filmmaking as well and immersive fabulation workshops. Um, which includes co-curating stretching materialities exhibition and co-organizing stretching census school. Yes, and maybe I'll toss to Jesse. Thank you, Yona. Um, my name is Jesse, and I am the co-founder and CEO of Alter. Um, so basically, Alter is a digital fashion platform that is dedicated to unlock the value of cultural heritage and also archival fashion. Um, I'm very passionate about bringing the technology and in innovation to the fashion space, but also connecting fashion from the past to the future. And um, thanks a lot for having me. I'm very excited about this panel today. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jesse. So uh, just providing extra little introduction, I would like to read two sentences uh, that I wrote a while ago when proposing this. So digital fashion so far posed itself as a new tool supporting marketing and business development but it can also support circular and sustainable development and has pr been proven in many different ways. Yet its cultural sustainability implications remain very much unexamined. This panel aims at sharing different perspectives and practices among researchers, practitioners, actively working with fashion and technology or digital fashion in the context of what could be called cultural preservation. So thinking about cultural heritage, cultural sustainability, locality, how those areas overlap. So that's why we will, I hope we'll have different perspectives. Um, I would like to start with presenting uh, a report that we created on funding strategies. Um, I think we started working on it two months ago and we, uh, and we made it available, I think a month ago. Uh, so this is relatively new and fresh. So I'd like to present this report that answers the question how digital assets uh, can support cultural sustainability and cultural heritage. It will be quite introductory presentation to the topic. And uh, as Jessie's work is also included in it, I would like her to continue with her time in presentation and then you and I will follow up and then maybe we can have like a short chat in the end. So I will 
share my screen. Do, do, do. Okay. And I hope you can see my screen now. As I don't see you, may I ask someone to just give me a shout out if you're seeing my uh, my screen at the moment. We can see it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, so when we started looking into different strategies and ideas around what does it mean to create digital assets around fashion and how they're being used and the kind of what values uh, underpin them, we saw that there is not much around just embracing culture in general. There's always some vision of future of some innovation that's being chased and certain like statical cues uh, associated with the terms are, are being chased there. So we decided just to gather different examples that we considered interesting and then just look at them and see what actually those digital assets and basically that means digital files, what do they, what can they do? Because there is a lot of uh, questions about value assigned to them. Are they valuable because of the financial potential, maybe they're valuable also for other reasons, sustainability being one of them. So this report looks at the 12 cases uh, where brands, designers, and artists introduce digital assets in support of cultural heritage and cultural sustainability. Uh, we are not saying that these are uh, the most best practices in the world, but I think it's a very starting point to see how digital assets could be used differently. Uh, and our aim is also to inform and inspire and kind of provide more insight and looking at them all together. Uh, and we collected in total 12. Uh, seven are off-chain, so not on blockchain, and five are on-chain. Today I'm not going to talk about all of them because we don't have time for that, but I will pick four that are most, I think, relevant to the topic. The key terms that are necessary uh, to be dismantled for these presentations are Web3, which we define as a technological stack responding to the issues and limitations of Web2, decentralized by nature, may incorporate blockchain technologies and token-based economics. So it's also an emerging techno-philosophical concept addressing the new vision of internet where users are in control of their own data and identity. And in fashion, it's closely linked to the new digital products, NFTs, creator economy, supply chain, product authentication, transparency. Um, and it's just, sometimes we could say it's just, you know, it's a response to the current limitations of the internet that we have now, Web2, and it's certain iteration towards more decentralized space. And then speaking of culture, culture is a very broad term, there are many definitions of it. But when we were doing it, we were particularly interested in cultural heritage. So heritage of tangible, intangible, and natural assets of a group or society that is inherited from past generations. So it's all about preservation, conservation, centering our memory values and giving voice also to marginalized heritages. Uh, and fashion is very often related to tradition, legacy, and craft. And then very, very important yet, I think, uh, underestimated or under-researched topic, uh, which is cultural sustainability. Uh, to some, it could be understood as almost the, uh, the antonym of cultural appropriation, uh, which is all about answering the questions, what cultures will exist in the future and whose cultural values will be represented. So especially if we are creating those new digital spaces and we are thinking about even more and more moving our lives online, it's also a question of representations uh, representation and telling different stories. So if we would assume that the time is linear, which is not, and we would like to see it, this is where we are somewhere here. We are somewhere, you know, Web 2, there's some past and there are different stories and different practices. So it's a question, how do we bring them uh, and how do we use them from the past to make them also part of the future? Web 2 uh, did tremendous things for fashion, if we think about it. Many things went on online, when we think about fashion exhibitions, it gave them the possibility to actually see or experience fashion shows, which also became a quite big successful phenomenon after, uh, I don't know, in early 2000s, that actually we can, we can just see photos or uh, even more complex forms of experiencing exhibitions, so we don't necessarily have to go and travel to see them. Um, so this is, this is already one of the interesting things that emerged during Web2 for kind of giving access and being able to experience fashion. 
We also have seen with uh, different social media platforms and microblogging like Pinterest or Tumblr that many people became curators or archivists and they were collecting and gathering many different themed uh, collections, archives of images uh, governed by certain teams. So actually everybody uh, became a creative mood boarder. You didn't have to be a fashion student to do that anymore uh, or many people just starting, you know, accumulating that, which led to a vast representation of certain images on certain topics and center genres. Obviously, this creates a paradox of uh, mass that we feel like everything is online, but obviously it's not. So it also kind of creates certain gaps uh, to it. And in response to that, there are many, many interesting projects that were launched, namely one of them, Fashion and Race Database, that kind of responds to what I just described. Uh, and we saw many different databases and archives uh, being launched either from academia or uh, independently. So it's quite uh, fascinating. Uh, but still the questions remain. Uh, what if we would create exhibition thinking that we can experience from the scratch from the beginning, digitally and physically? Or when we think about social media, who really owns those visual collections? And what happens when the platform ceases to exist? This uh, I experienced in my life with MySpace or with... Uh, also partially with Tumblr. So it's the question, who gets to say what gets included and what gets excluded, and who is the real, real owner of that content? Uh, and also question about fashion archives. What if fashion archives would not only show and tell stories, but also could incentivize creators and bring communities together? Uh, so that's another... These are the questions that also uh, are being raised when we are thinking about the new internet and what free. So looking at the cases that we collected, uh, the ones that are off-chain, meaning they are not on blockchain, one of the quite interesting examples is Superficial Studio. Uh, the project and the aim and the purpose of it was just to archive beautiful, famous pieces uh, and give people access to them and see as they move. So as much as this is a fantastic experience, the main aim is to show garments as digital assets from different, uh, from different angles and experience them in different uh, on-screen way. Uh, another project that I'm very fond of because uh, I was a master thesis supervisor here, uh, it was developed by Rosella Franco at Anne de Berlin in, uh, I believe, maybe 2021. I don't remember now, but it was uh, a little bit time ago. Rosella had this idea that she would like to preserve uh, the craftsmanship from India, and she would like to create a platform called DGI Craft, where actually current people uh, in need of that could reach out to those artisans. So it will be on one hand a gesture of preservation but and giving visibility, but on the other thinking how it could also be, I don't know, a form of marketplace or a place where people can... Uh, actually serve their skills and services. So this is already quite interesting how digitizing, I don't know, a certain beading uh, techniques could also support that. Uh, another uh, example that I would like to maybe uh, show is this quite fantastic uh, show uh, when telling stories relevant on communities and reimagining past for the future can also include fashion. Uh, during the Indigenous Fashion Week, the Mohawk artist Kawanetti created a project about post-Indigenous futures. She has been for many, many years uh, creating videos uh, based on Second Life, where she envisions what Indigenous life could look like. Uh, and here she brought her virtual world to the runway and pre presented Calico and Camouflage Assemble. Uh, what is also interesting that uh, this was also presented in the streets of Montreal uh, as a kind of, uh, yeah, also real-life exhibition. So it is a quite interesting project that also gives uh, visibility to certain people and reimagines their futures and is brought to the Fashion Week. Uh, in a similar way as a gesture is this AI-generated uh, fashion show that never happened, uh, 
where traditional African Nigerian fashion was mixed with Afrofuturism and envisioned as a show with senior citizens. So this fashion show never really happened uh, by Malik Af- uh, Afagboa, but it also has this massive potential for storytelling and also thinking how we implement and use AI in creating potential fashion futures. Uh, this report was also uh, supported by um, uh, two uh, fantastic people. One of them is Erika de Greff, who is a co-founder, uh, co-founder of African Fashion Research Institute. And here I'd like to read her quote from her recent text with uh, uh, Angela Janssen. We are taken to unlearn the claim of one universal fashion system. It faces us with the responsibility to activate a global network of connected yet self-determining fashioning coalitions for an environmentally and culturally sustainable, ethical, and socially just fashionscape. And then other examples uh, that are on-chain, so they use blockchain technology uh, in the way they operate, uh, very often utilize uh, NFTs. So here we can see two examples of fashion archives, which are trying to collect money uh, for digitizing fashion assets, so bringing money to uh, basically keep the archives run. Uh, one of very interesting projects, which I'm not going to talk much about because Jessie's here with us and she will probably uh, say more interesting things about Alter and what she does, so I will skip this one. Uh, but one of the projects that I also uh, worked on myself uh, and I think is relevant in this context is a partnership that was led by a fashion startup, digital fashion startup, Dematerialized, with Sedim, a school in Monterrey, Mexico, where an interdisciplinary group of designers uh, created a virtual world and a different, uh, a different garments together working as a co-creators with a local community. And the task that we challenged the students with was thinking, how can we bring indigenous knowledge to web free? And I still think it's a very relevant question and I hope we'll see more projects like that and more answers to it. Uh, the second person that reviewed our report is Maria Paula Fernandez, a co-founder of JPEG Protocol and the Department of Decentralization. Uh, and when we asked Maria to review our report, she also added that Web3 is not about ownership or speculative assets. It refers to a stack of technologies that are decentralized, permissionless, and censorship resistant, able to archive, preserve, and store cultural objects, as well as building alternative resilient technological systems. Uh, and last project I would like to share that I, that I really like, and I think it's uh, important when we think about communities impact and also about localities um, thinking who gets to decide what gets uh, included what gets archived uh, is the archive which is a DAO a decentralized uh, autonomous organization which is a museum admitting people from around the world as members and enabling them to vote on what historical and artistic artifacts the museum will acquire uh, here in the case, we see a fan that was used in Madonna's performance in 1990. This is what community voted for. But we can also envision how certain communities could also support what's being collected on their behalf to tell their stories in places like ethnographic museum or fashion history museums uh, that are around the world very often where someone is telling someone else's uh, story. And uh, yeah, that's pretty pretty much it. So to summarize, I would say that that we can see that digital assets in fashion can help to archive through digitizing, preserve craft, create access. Uh, they can also put archives on chain, accumulate funding for archives, work with different communities, incentivize creators, because this is, I didn't mention that, but when we were working on a project where co-creating with a community and thinking about indigenous knowledge and web free, uh, we're also thinking how the project in the end could incentivize uh, those uh, who worked on it not only the ones uh, who initiated the thing. Tell stories relevant to our communities and reimagine past for the future. Uh, this report is open access, is online, and it's uh, aimed to be shared both with industry and people interested in research on that. So yeah, that's, uh, that's all for me, and I will stop sharing my screen now. And yeah, I think we can maybe have a little chat in the end together. So I will now, as I mentioned, Jesse's work. So I will give now the stage to Jesse. Thank you, Beata. Let me sh- quickly share my screen as well.
Let me know you can see the presentation. Yes. Perfect. Um, so as um, also really proudly be included um, in Beata's um, research. So basically the startup that I'm working on, the project is called Alter. Um, so basically we are a digital fashion platform that is dedicated to unlocking the value of cultural heritage and archive fashion. We believe the innovation technology, it doesn't really only connect us to the future, but also the past. Um, so Alter represents alternative. We relieve fashion heritage in the alternative digital realm and we innovate um, through alteration as well. So what we're seeing here is the world is actually changing. Um, many of us are spending way more time online um, and also more money potentially on virtual goods as well. Um, for instance, 4.7 hours on average um, for the Gen Z uh, population are spending in the virtual space. And also um, we are expecting for the virtual asset is gonna be $56 billion market in 2030. On the other hand, what we see is the world is actually built on history. And the value of fashion archives until now has definitely been trapped in their physicality. It is not really accessible to us as the fragile nature of the fashion archives. We probably only have the possibility to visit them um, in the museum and behind the glass wall. And the rich narratives behind those fashion archives is also somehow disconnected with today's audience because of limited viable venues that we can join them. And if we're looking at the fashion houses, actually they only start to preserve those archives um, in the 1980s. And after 40 years over, and many of the fashion archives are also facing the risk of deterioration. And they are in high protection in um, different warehouses or archive libraries, which don't necessarily provide enough access to their internal users or even um, external brand audiences. And that is what we as Alter really wanted to bring the beautiful history in fashion, not only for archive fashion, but also for cultural heritage to uh, using the vehicle of um, digital medium. So when we talk about like archive fashion, um, many people will think about um, luxury fashion houses. And in fact, uh, luxury fashion houses only emerged after the industrial revolution of uh, 1850s. And fashion has way longer history, all the way goes back to ancient Egypt and also across different geographic borders. And we believe history is really the base layer of creativity and now with the advancement of technology, including AR, VR, 3D, or, in, or actually uh, recently the po most popular idea is generative AI, for instance, it should enable us to also have access to the past. And that is really um, what Alter's vision is. Uh, we want to propel the longevity of fashion heritage, making that accessible to the digitally focused generation and also many generations to come. And we wanted to celebrate culture and individuality in fashion and inspire future generation of creativity as well. So here is an example that we also bring um, the, one of the Chinese culture uh, from 1,500 years ago to the inspiration and making that um, museum-like virtual space and for user to interact with that. And normally you can only visit the museum after you go to the certain location. But what we use is a digital medium or the digital space that to exhibit um, this um, beautiful garment and um, providing access to many people around the world. And besides that, what is important for archive fashion or cultural heritage is really about the history behind it. And where did it take the reference? And for Alter, what we are building is we are aggregating all the informations, including the video format, the picture format, and also the text um, for user to really understand the history behind a design of a garment or how we relieve uh, the, re uh, the original garment in the digital space. And you can also see um, the deconstruction of the garment and have a little bit more interactive um, you know, play around uh, archive fashion or cultural heritage fashion. Also, for you know, like 
digital fashion, one of the aspects is beyond you can only look at, at, at the fashion garment. You can, on, you can also experience that. For instance, we can have like virtual try-on experience, which you can actually wear those precious pieces, um, which is normally on exhibition in the museum or in the fashion houses archives. And there are more utilities um, from the digital fashion that is, you know, around cultural heritage or archive fashion. For instance, uh, one of the quite interesting example is a digital souvenir. I'm a really big fan of going to different exhibitions. And every time after I left the exhibition, I have been so much connected with a certain brand or certain theme of the exhibition. But what I took away is normally a postcard. Whereas a postcard doesn't necessarily connect me to a community and continue the conversation with a brand or with different cultural institutions. And I believe in the future, we will have digital souvenirs, which will help you as a user to unlock different connections or access um, and further your conversation um, with a brand or with different institutions. Also, as what I mentioned before, in terms of like virtual try on or um, direct to avatar that we can really wear a piece of garment that have so much value in terms of historical, cultural, and also, you know, like your emotional connection with this piece um, to relieve those iconic moments in fashion and essentially unlock unlimited metaverse potential, but with a purpose of um, preserving the physical garments in real life as well. So with that, actually moving to the digital space, um, we are more connected than ever. And with the creative canvas as wider than ever, are we going to see more homogeneity or diversity? This question was asked for many times you know, to, to myself. Um, the reason is because after globalization, as we are more connected, we see the aesthetic um, you know, like in fashion in different large cities around the world are quite homogeneity. Uh, towards the homogeneity side. And because metaverse or the digital space will unlock us a lot of like potentials as a creator to create. But since we share the same tools, same resource, and also very connected using tools such as generative AI, and how do we ensure the diversity of that? And this is something definitely as author, we, we wanted to contribute and we wanted to bring the original version where those garments or those artisans come from. For instance, recently we have launched an initiative, it's called Digital Meets Culture. We wanted to showcase that the digital space, the digital fashion, the future of digital fashion is not only for the futuristic styles, but also really connects us to the cultural heritage and also providing um, the opportunity to showcase to people around different parts of the world the potential that they can get more visibility to the global audience from their original, you know, like the artisan or the craftsmanship. And that is crafted with what we call it at Alter Digital Savoir We wanted to commit the same level of craftsmanship to bring what has been done in real life to the digital space and really celebrate culture and individuality. And this, um, we are very happy to um, also partnership with uh, Decentraland um, as they have the Metaverse Fashion Week, which was pi very pioneered um, starting from last year. And this is the second version of that. Um, and the theme actually for this year is called Future Heritage. And Alter is really proud to be part of that. And we are very proud to bring um, 10 different cultures to Metaverse Fashion Week, not only on Decentraland, but to other two, um, you know, like uh, um, digital spaces as well, and trying to increase the visibility for the designers that some of them, um, they are, it's a first time for them to experience what does that mean by digital fashion and how does that mean by reaching out to a wider audience in a, in a global space. Um, so this will be happen on 22nd, uh, 28th until uh, 31st of March. And um, you are more than welcome to, you know, like visit our website and register for the participation um, of the Metaverse Fashion Week. So um, with that, um, at Alder, we always ask this question. 
with all the technologies that are available to us today, what do you want to bring to the future of fashion? And for us, it's always culture and individuality. Um, I'm very thanks a lot for um, having me today, and um, I'm very happy to have further discussion or answering your question as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Jesse. Uh, and now, uh, last but not least, Yuna, please. Can you see the slide? Yeah. All right. <laughs> Can key flow through pixels? So in this short presentation, I would like to talk about cosmologically specific digital garments. It would mean not just replicating the visual appearance of an existing cultural heritage, in pixels, yet thinking of the local cosmology that shapes such type of clothing. I explore this through the case of collaboratively working on an augmented reality hanbok. The term hanbok was only introduced in the late 19th century, um, referring to Korean clothing to differentiate it from Japanese or Western style attire. So some people prefer to simply call it uriot, which translates as our clothes. Dating back to the Three Kingdoms of Korea period from 57 BC, the basic structure of hanbok consists of a top, chogori, with pants, paji, and or a skirt, chima, with po worn over the set. A number of hanbok scholars argue that this structure is influenced by the clothing of Eurasian nomads, Scythians, an ensemble of top and pants. And we can see hanbok is constantly transforming until now. Although nowadays most people living in Korea wear industrially manufactured Western style clothes, meanwhile, where did all the hanbok go? Historian Robert Ross recounts how the cultural, political, and economical power of Europe and North America in the practical sense of production and distribution of clothing is related to the adoption of standard Western style dress worldwide. Does homogenizing garment structure as well as its production system imply losing diverse modes of being in the world? As an anthropologist, I look into this matter through spending time with Korean clothes makers and weavers, as well as wearing and making hanboks myself in both digital and physical realm. To get into digital fashion that is cosmologically specific, I construe hanbok as a cosmic thing through John Tresh's work, or a case of cosmotechnics, borrowing the term from philosopher Yu Kui. This strand of thinking stemmed from my main field site, activist and hanbok designer Igion's Atelier. Since the 1980s, Igion led grassroots movements of wearing working class hanboks as a voice acting against neoliberalism and dictatorship. In her atelier, I noticed a big Meridian poster hanging on the wall. She said, you can't make clothes without understanding the body. So I signed up for an acupuncture study group. At the acupuncture class, I've learned the basics of East Asian cosmology. The cosmos is perpetually shifting as 10,000 things are woven together through the interaction of yin and yang. These things are a symbiotic part of the coagulation and dispersion of qi, the energy force. The human body is a small universe, and this microcosmos is the soundest when it flows with the surrounding. Grounded on this common figuration, sharing of a garment is considered as an act of passing energy. When a child is born, the baby's first clothing, penetogori, is made of used clothes from an elderly in the same village. It is because the good key in the elderly's clothes will be transmitted to the baby's clothes and the newborn will live a long life. After all, hanbok wear is borrowing the principle of the universe. Kion, who practices acupuncture herself, translates the notion of flow of microcosmos through clothing. The clothes should make paths for the air and the energy to flow. The loose structure of hanbok is only tightened in acupuncture spots that promote the energy flow. For example, points where one ties the pants are called pungnyu, which is a point that strengthens the kidney. And the point of the sock pressures yongchanhyeol, which works like a battery charger, recharging one's energy. Hanbok is a combination of flat geometric circle, triangle, and square-shaped pieces that only become three-dimensional when it is covering a body. In East Asia, circle is known as a symbol for heaven, square as the earth, and triangle as the in-between being such as humankind. Following such relation, Hanbok researcher Tegum Sok argues that principles of Hanbok structure follows the logic of the universe. But how can one digitize Hanbok as a cosmic thing? Do avatars have acupuncture points or can key flow through pixels? 
Anthropologist Heidi Geismar faced similar issues tackling digital images of a Maori cloak. Her question was to digitalize heritage, incorporating local ways of engaging with objects within wider spiritual and social relationships rather than being fixated on the visual. She asks, what happens if we translate the cloak into other kinds of data, like merging a digital image of the cloak with a Maori weaving chant? Geismar and collaborators even converted a 3D scanned cloak data into topographical representations within a gaming software for users to fly over. If digital hanbok embodies the constantly shifting cosmos where things exist in relations, it could be an interactive, dynamic being rather than a static image. A melodic garment or a wearable cloud were discussed as a different kind of hanbok. Yet in 2020, I had a chance to collaborate with a computer scientist, Julian Letelier, to create an augmented reality experience that works with any browser, any web browser centered around hanbok and its cosmologies. We first took the relationship between human, earth, heaven, and hanbok circle, triangle, and square patterns as a starting point. Pressing each shape of the pattern would give birth to multiple things such as the soil, cloud, and mushrooms, but also satellites, cars, and office chairs depicting the social and ecological arrangements in intentionally and unintentionally created by colonialism and industrialization. We use stretching gestures, like this, for the transformation of hanbok as a key touch gesture of the experience. One stretch with three fingers will bring hanbok to its fabric state, and then to a CT scan of a silk cocoon from Korea scanned by Nikolai Rosenthal, which then leads to silkworms and mulberry trees. This scene aims to show how diverse actants are in relation to co-creating the material. Weaver Hoho from Hamtang and Igion Story were played with their voices, bringing people in Korea to contingent contexts where users might open the web page. In a sense, Igion's garment continued to activate cosmological relations, even in a digital form. Digital tools were definitely not a simple conversion device, yet added complexity to this newborn object. Julian shared the coding. Some lines of codes were based on existing libraries, which could have transmitted the long-living key. Choice of web AR made the experience accessible with most web browsers. It doesn't require permission, downloading an app, or logging in. Although it is not a fundamental solution, this choice attempts to address the digital inequality corresponding to the flow that is not trapped in a paid environment, paid app environment, yet floating in the web encoding certain Korean modes of existence. The making process of 3D hanbok did not include the sounds of a sizzling hot iron and cutting mistakes resulting with wobbly edges of sleeves. Instead, glitches, errors and an unexpected behaviours of the pixel alongside the heated self-built computer brought, brought about a particular aspect of the current into the, digital, uh, into the cultural heritage. Perhaps key is indeed, indeed flowing through pixels while different passages of worlding meet and clash and result in the form of a digital object, like when I discuss Korean cosmology with Julian in English through Zoom and Mirrorboard. Digitalizing cultural heritage in certain directions proves that the so-called traditional garments are not fossilized behind a museum vitrine or labeled as a costume. Such attempts, even though clumsy, could be a way how hanbok is actively taking part of the transforming world, multiplying through the fi friction between commercialization of daily life and reimagination of heritage, stepping out from archives and transforming the landscapes they are situated in. Thank you for your attention and looking forward to any questions or comments. Thank you so much for this great presentation to both of you. Um, I would like to say that uh, as we want to be presenting it live, if anyone has any comments or questions, there is a link in the description of the video that you're watching now uh, that you can also probably, someone will share with you. So you can, if you have any questions for us or comments, please kindly type them in. And if you want, obviously add your name so then Maybe within two or three days, we will be able to respond. Um, as you come from different fields uh, and different spaces, but are interested in quite similar topics, I was curious maybe if you have questions to one another, uh, and if there was something that you know, maybe you think maybe we could maybe we could take like just five minutes to have like a little exchange between uh, both of you. What what would you think about that? Sounds great. <laughs> 
I was actually really intrigued by um, Jesse's upcoming event in the Decentraland. Um, maybe can you introduce a bit more on that part? I would also add to that that I was very curious how the curators, because I know there are curators involved in it, so what is also the role of a curator in this event? That would be also maybe is my follow-up question to Yuna's question. Yeah, definitely. It was really um, interesting experience. Um, so basically, we are having an open call um, to, you know, like call for 10 different cultures. And the purpose of that is we wanted to showcase, you know, like the digital fashion is not only for the future rustic styles, but also we wanted those people who are only probably have a physical design, a physical garment, also experience what is a potential of digital space or digital fashion. Um, and with that, we actually also have a few um, curators and to help us to call for different cultures. And at the end, I believe we have around like 40 or almost like 50 applications and from really different parts of the world. And um, we, we need to have like the technical assessment and also like trying to bring the diversity um, assessment also like to bring together 10 different cultures and moving to the production side and also the testing of, com you know, like how to make that um, 3D file compatible in different virtual environment. Actually, that is one of the challenge, how you can increase the visibility in different virtual spaces as so far the 3D production pipeline is still involve a lot of like manual process. I am very looking forward to the new technologies that can increase efficiency. Um, but also I see a lot of like poten potential already um, or interest already from people um, that they probably never heard of a uh, digital fashion before. But now it's one of the opportunity for them to showcase that in different venues um, digitally. So the, just if I can, uh, just for clarification, so this event would be that in this decentral land, people can come in and try on different 3D garments from 40 different cultures, is that... So basically, this event is called like Metaverse Fashion Week. Um, so it's originally, um, you know, like uh, launched by Decentraland in 2022. And this is the second year they run the Metaverse Fashion Week. And um, on Decentraland is what we call a little bit like low poly vo version of the 3D asset. And there you can visit and you can see those garments um, in a storefront. Um, and also in, for this particular Metaverse Fashion Week, for those 10 different cultures, 10 different garments, we are also exhibit on two other Metaverse venues. One is called Spatial and one is called Soil Land, which is designed by Artificial Rome. Um, and that is um, especially for Artificial Rome, that is uh, a little bit like high poly version of that built on Unreal Engine. Um, and then the you know like the purpose for us is trying to increase the vis visibility and for people to experience in different venues and um because you know like in the for the metaverse concept or web3 concept many people will talk about um interoperability where one piece of garment can be exhib exhibit or can be used in different dig digital um, spaces but that is definitely the technology still like undergoing but what we wanted to try is showcase the potential of di like various different locations in the, in the digital world thank you <laughs> that, that that's interesting will you be showcasing it on your website how so the idea is to digitize existing garment one-to-one -one, uh, and then have it across different platforms according to their settings of how digital fashion can look like right to sum it up. Yes, exactly. And it will be very interesting to see then how those different garments uh, look like, digitized for those different pl platforms, low poly, high poly, and so on. Uh, and Yuna, can I ask you a question? Why did you straight away thought, I know this is almost a core of your research, but what do you think about this kind of one-on-one -on -one digitizing of a garment? Do you, do you think... Do you think it has potential value or for, your, for you, for your practice, there is more to it? What do you think about it? Because you provide also this interesting example uh, where I think a, a piece of cloth of textiles was digitized into a landscape. So uh, what is so attractive or valuable for you in this, you know, stretching those possibilities? 
Yeah, I think um, let's say Beata knows, but I used to um, work with digital garments and I was organizing this collective called Wearing Pixels. So I was very much into translating clothes into the digital realm. And probably what frustrated me was like in the digital space, we we don't have to be a human body, but the digital garments itself are still in the shape of what we wear now with the sleeves and the pants, the shapes. And learning more about Hamburg and the cosmology embedded in it, I think I saw like potential that this object in the digital realm doesn't necessarily have to look like it. And instead, maybe it can highlight certain aspects of the object in a different form like i i feel like sometimes when i wear this type of garment and when the wind blows i listen to this sound of like fabric touching each other and my skin and wonder like closing my eyes it will be an amazing sound piece even and i will feel more attached to the sound piece rather than a one-on-one -on -one visual translation of this on an avatar for example so i think that kind of way of thinking made me more lean towards this expansion of formality in the digital space let's say yeah cool thank you thank you so much uh jesse do you have any question for you now I love this project and I really feel like how you bring, you know, like the heritage part and also interpretation of that um, and achieve a lot of things that probably, you know, in real life, it's really hard to abstract a lot of things and um, express that in real life. And that is making it possible in a, in a digital space, but rooted back to the cultural heritage. And I think that is really a great concept. So I have one question for you know, is like, um, in terms of like, how do you use or how the user can interact um, with, a, with the experiment, experience uh, that you provided? Well, it was developed in 2020 with numerous people, actually. Julian was the core person. Um, but it was developed as a web AR piece for an exhibition. So anyone can log in with their smartphones or we had like extra tablets and phones for people that don't have these devices. And there you can just access through a website and then you see like a camera screen and a piece of Hamburg and then you can click different pieces and it will activate different environments and elements within your physical space. And then at some point, there's a phone call from the weaver, and then you hear the story of the weave and from the clothes maker as well. And then you kind of um, access the knowledge, like Jesse, you did with the Dunhuang pieces. Like, I think it's like the historical knowledge coming into the digital pieces. And then um, there was also an interactive game where you can explore the zero waste aspect of Hamburg. And then in the end, use the stretching gestures to like see what different non-human actors were involved in creating this garment so it was yeah like a gamey gamified approach perhaps yeah or experiential as many people like to say today yeah <laughs> cool thank you thank you so much i hope we will uh i think there are very interesting links because one of you is very much heavily representing the world of research and academia and i see that in your practice this design anthropology approach and then Jesse is uh, running a startup. So I, I, it's very interesting me, to me to see that there are so many parallels and links. Uh, I hope that we will receive some questions and feedback. So I'm encouraging everyone to uh, share it with us and especially thinking about what we were all presenting and discussing today in the context of Central Asia and Silk Road, because this is what uh, the Responsible Fashion Series this year are focusing on. So thank you so much for being here aspect of